welcome you into God's house this morning. Hallelujah. We've come to give God praise and to exalt His name in this place. I believe in the blood of Jesus. I believe in His power.
Yes, Father, we could do nothing short of this. And oh, Lord Jesus, how could we not stand in awe of you? Holy Spirit of God. Yes. Because you, God, in three persons, are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You, God, in three persons, are the savior of this world. Oh, how we bless you this morning, Father. How we glorify you, Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit of God. We lift you up and exalt in your holy, wonderful name, standing in awe of you, recognizing that you are the creator of the heavens, the earth, the entire universe, and you did it with a word. Oh, you are all-powerful, you are omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. We bless you this morning. You are our Lord. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. We glorify, we magnify, we lift up your holy, wonderful name. We exalt you this morning. And indeed, oh God, we stand in awe, in awe of your power, in awe of your goodness in all of your mercy, in all of your love, in all of your long suffering, in all of your attributes that make you the true, the living, and the only God. And we, your people that are called by your name, we bless you this morning, lifting you appropriately, exalting, exalting your holy, wonderful name, for you are worthy, you are worthy, worthy to be praised, worthy to be glorified, and worthy to be magnified. Yes, we do stand this morning in your presence, in awe of you. We bow our hearts before you in worship and in praise, in exaltation, O oh God. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit of God. We bless, we magnify, and we exalt your holy, wonderful name. Hallelujah to our God. Hallelujah to our God. Praise the name of the living God. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name, Lord Jesus. Redeemer, Savior, Lord and God. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, I just feel like worshiping and praising him. He's so wonderful. He is so glorious. He is so glorious. Oh, come on, let's lift it to him this morning. Whether we can sing or not, let's shout it out out there.
the living God. We welcome you in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord, and it's so good to celebrate once again the Lord's Supper. Amen? And to call to remembrance all that He had done for us, all that He has, all that He continues to do through His shed blood. The power of the cross continues to work today, to change lives, to bring about healing and deliverance, and to save souls out of darkness and to bring them into the knowledge of the truth. Amen? So we thank you, Jesus, for your blood today, for laying your life down so that we can live and have life and have a new start. We just want to bless you and thank you for your presence here this morning and for your continued faithfulness upon our lives. We commit the entire service into your hands. We ask that you will speak to us, Holy Spirit, through your word, and have your way in us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 That song is so beautiful. Amen. Well, the Lord has a word for us as he usually does. And we're going to just build upon the foundation that was laid a few weeks ago by our pastor. At the beginning of this year... The Lord gave our pastor a message which he entitled, Going a Little Further. How many of you remember that? And that message kind of set the pace and the stage for the weeks ensuing. And we heard a lot about going a little further in our relationship with God, with regards to prayer, with regards to devotion, with regards to church attendance, and with regards to our general approach to the things of God in general. Well, the Lord wants to continue building upon that foundation, and he wants to speak to us this morning on the question of our love walk. Now, how many of you know that there are two commandments, right? The first one, that we should love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second, which is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the first commandment was covered as we were instructed to go a little further in our relationship with God, to go a little deeper. And now Lord, the Lord wants to zero in on our love walk, which will involve our relationships one with the other. And so we want to just listen with the air of the Spirit this morning and hear what the Lord wants to say to us as he encourages us to come up higher and to go a little further in the things that we have learned. Now love, as we know it, which is the agape love of God, is the defining mark of true Christianity. I'll say that again. Love is the defining mark of true Christianity. Jesus said to us in the Gospel of John, he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another and he goes on to say by this by love shall all men both the saved and the unsaved know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other he says by this not by anything else. So we see that love is the defining mark that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. So it's not about how much money we can give to the poor that will determine, that people will see that we are Christians, or how much money we give to the ministry. It's not about how good we could preach, or how good we could sing, or how good we can do anything for the Lord. It's all about the character and the nature of our Lord, which is love, being evidenced through the lives that we live that causes people to know that we are his disciples. Amen? So it's not about all the other things that we think people will see and recognize that we are, you know, we are born again, we are disciples of Christ. 
It is about the character and the nature of our Lord being evidenced through our lives that will cause people to know that we are his disciples. The problem with the church world today is that we are getting caught up with a lot of outer appearance stuff. That's the problem with the church world today. We're getting caught up with hype, we're getting caught up with show, and we're getting caught up with things that seek to only promote self. And most of us, we are measuring spirituality based on performance rather than, you know, our performance rather than godly character. We see a person who may be eloquent, who can speak very proficiently, and who can flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or who can sing, or who can do something kind of exceptional, and we automatically feel that they are God's best friend. Because we measure, we tend to measure spirituality with performance. But the Bible says this is not the yardstick by which we judge people or even we judge ourselves. You know, sometimes we can feel, oh gosh, you know, God is ready with me because I'm doing this or doing that or I can do it very well. But that is not how we judge people and that's not how we judge our own selves. Do you know that there are many unsaved people who are very gifted and very talented in whatever area? They are gifted in communication. They are gifted academically. They are gifted to sing. They are gifted to play. Does that make them spiritual? So it's not based on performance. Okay? But yet in the church world, we, put, we seek to put people on pedestals because they are gifted. Spirituality, brothers and sisters, is, is more than ability and it's more than just a show. It's more than just an ability to do something. It all has to do with character development, which reflects who we are as people. And that I'm so thankful this morning that we are under a banner of holiness. And that even though sometimes we might get fed up of the central message that comes from this platform, God is about changing lives from the inside out. Okay, the power of God is released as we developed spiritually. And so this is the key. This is the key to our advancement in God. This is the key by which, or the evidence by which men will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, God wants to speak to us concerning our approach to others. And I'm not talking just to people in church, but to people in general. He's, he says that, by this shall all men. You know, we can have one front for church people, and we can have another front for people outside, right? But God wants to speak to us concerning our approach to people in general. And he wants to speak to us concerning our attitudes, our thinking, our heart condition, and our behavior. All things that we have heard many times again. But this morning, God wants to challenge us to go a little further in this area of love. Amen? Now, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, I'm still building, so you don't have to turn. The Apostle, the Apostle Paul prayed for the church at Thessalonica. Okay? And his prayer was that they should increase and they should abound in love one towards another and towards all men. This was Paul's prayer for the church at Thessalonica. And that, that they should increase and that they should abound in love one towards another and towards all men. Now the saints, at, uh, the saints or believers then at Thessalonica were already flowing in a measure of God's love towards each other. They would send money to the saints at Jerusalem. They would assist Paul on their journeys. But Paul's prayer was that they will continue to increase and that they will continue to abound in this area. The words increase and abound suggest that there be growth that there be expansion, that there be multiplication, that there be overflow, that there be an abundance of love in their Christian walk. So by this, we should know that 
we should never remain where we are. There is always room for development in every area of our lives. And most of us have come through and we have reached, attained a certain level of Christianity and we are flowing in a certain dimension of love. But God wants us to abound and increase in this area. He wants us to continue to grow and continue to expand in this particular area of our lives. And I'm sure that most of us could testify that when we first became born again, one of the things that we experienced when we first got saved was an overwhelming love for the Lord. Not so? And, a, and an overwhelming love for God's people. Those were the two things that we first experienced at the point of getting saved. A love for the Lord and a love for God's people. But like everything else, that deposit of love that God placed in our hearts for him and for his church, at the point of being saved, he expects that deposit to grow. And he expects that deposit to develop as we continue to grow and mature in the things of God. And as we exercise ourselves in doing what is right and doing what is pleasing in God's sight. So the measure of love that we received from the Lord at the point of salvation, God expects us to build upon that foundation. And he expects that deposit to grow within us so that we will fall more and more in love with Jesus each and every day. And we will become more perfect in the love of God towards each other. If we do not cultivate our love walk, brothers and sisters, it's going to die. If we do not cultivate it, if we do not seek, see that it is an, an important part of our lives, that deposit will eventually die. And that is why so many Christians grow cold on the Lord and eventually some of them even backslide. And some people become hard-hearted towards people. It's because we fail and they fail to cultivate that deposit of love in their hearts. Amen? And so we want to look at what love is in the true sense. And also we need to look at the things that we need to do in order to develop in this area. Now, we want, the first thing we want to establish is that God is love, okay? It's the essence of who he is. The Bible says that God is love. It is the essence of his persona. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16 tells us that God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So it's all a part of God. It is God's love that reached down and touched us. It is God's love that is extended to us each and every day in the midst of our frailty and in the midst of all our humanity. Amen? Love is also a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is one of the characteristics of God the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 tells us, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. And it manifests itself in joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, etc., etc. So the love that we are speaking about, the God kind of love, is not just a feeling and it's not just an emotion. Okay? It's much deeper than that. Many times as believers, we confuse love with feeling. And when the feeling is not there, we say we do not love anymore. But this is not true. That's the way that the world interprets love. That's the way the world operates. That is the way that Hollywood portrays love. But that's not the way that we are supposed to operate as Christians and as children of God. But, sad, but sad to say, there are many of us that operate at this level, the level of just feeling. And hence the reason there are so many breakups in marriages, there are breakups in relationships, is because our love for each other is just very shallow, is very superficial, and is based on feeling. God wants us to go past feeling today. He wants us to operate at a higher level and to go 
further and to understand what he is requiring of us. Our walk with God should not be based on feeling, but on faith and obedience to God. Our walk with God, our love for God, should not be based on feeling. It should be based on our faith and our obedience to the word of God. What happens a morning when we get up and we don't feel? And that's a mistake that some of us, you know, we make and we feel like if God has left us and we stop praying because we're not feeling and we're not as devoted because we're not feeling. So that love, our love walk, both with God, with each other, is more than just a feeling. It's not based on feeling. Feeling, of course, operates at times, but it doesn't operate all the time. Because feelings are very fickle, and they can change in an, in an instant depending on the circumstances and the situations that surround us. Let's just take, like, if someone just um, does something or says something that is either irritating or annoying to us, we will see how quick the feeling of love disappears. Not so? Right. So the love that we are speaking about today goes beyond the feeling if God were to treat us the way that we treat other people sometimes, where would all of us be today? If it was just based on feeling. If God was to respond to us, if God who is love would respond to us just based on feeling, depending on how we respond or where we, where, you know, what we do, where would we be today? God wants us to go beyond that level and to go a little further. So the question is, what is love? And how do we define love? We already stated what it is not. Well, if you want to write this down, this definition, love is a quality or an attribute of God that is rooted and demonstrated in commitment, care, and goodwill towards others in spite of who they are and what they have done. This is what the agape love of God is. This is how it is defined. It is a quality or attribute of God that is rooted and demonstrated in commitment, care, and goodwill towards others in spite of who they are and in spite of what they have done. It's un conditional it's unconditional love it's not based on performance it's not based on where someone has come from or their past it is this type of love God love God's agape love that reached down to us when we were sinners when we were doing our own thing when we were living our lives out of control. It is this agape love of God that reached down and touched us and changed us in spite of who we were in society. And that's what I love about the church of Jesus Christ. All are welcome. All. People who walk at, in high places, those who walk at low places, those who walk in the middle places, regardless it is the love of God that touches all of our lives. In spite of all the horrible things that we have done, in spite of our color, in spite of our race, in spite of our creed, and this is how God wants us to be in our relationships one with the other. This is how God wants us to live. And that is why his word says, and by this, this example, this fruit of the Holy Spirit flowing through our lives, all men will know that you are my disciples. Why? Because we are reflecting God. We're reflecting who he is in person and in character. And we have the power within us to become all that he has called us to be. Now, no unredeemed person or no unsaved person can love in this way. No unredeemed person or no unsaved person can love in this way. It is only those of us who are born of God's Holy Spirit, 
who have the power of God within us, residing in us, can love people in this manner. So to say that we can't do that is an excuse. Because at the point of being saved, God the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in us. And within our spirit is his character and his nature. We just have to develop in those areas and cause Jesus to shine through us. Amen? And so when we want to make comparisons between us and the unsaved, it can be an unsaved relative, an unsaved friend, and we want to say, but you can do this, you can love, you can forgive. They don't have the power within them to do it. But we as children of God, there is no excuse for us. We can walk in that dimension of God's love because of the deposit of the Holy Spirit residing within us. And so God is calling us up higher to build upon the foundation, to build upon the deposit that has been made in our lives at the point of our salvation. And we build by responding to the instruction of God's word. We build upon this foundation by obedience, by listening to the instruction of God's word and putting it into practice in our relationships one with the other. Amen? Amen. So we want to turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 13. And we're going to be looking at two short verses. Romans chapter 13. And we're going to be reading from verses from verse 8. Are we all there? Romans chapter 13, from verse 8. The Bible says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt commit adultery, thou shalt not, thou shalt not commit adultery, Father forgive me, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill. To his neighbor. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, this scripture starts off by saying, Oh, no man, anything. So, if you're here this morning and you have borrowed something from someone, you've borrowed it. And it's in your cupboard or in your drawer. Please give it back. Okay? It's scriptural. If you have borrowed money from someone and made arrangements to liquidate that debt, please honor your word and keep your commitment. The Bible says, Oh, no man, anything. If you have taken goods or clothes or shoes on credit, you know, we're famous for taking, we're paying down on something. We need to pay that person what is due to them. There's a lot of, lot of confusion takes place concerning money matters. Because children of God, we don't honor our word and our commitments. And because we feel that we borrowed it from a saved person, a brother or sister, we feel that we can take advantage of their goodness. But God will take, hold us accountable for that. So, oh no man, nothing. It's a reproach to Christ when we don't honor our word. This is just in passing, okay? It's a reproach to Christ and it brings a bad name on ourselves. When we borrow things from people, when we borrow money and we don't pay back, we get a, a stigma to our name. So we need to honor our commitments. We need to do what is right both in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. And not bring a reproach to Jesus Christ because of our bad ways. 
Now the word of God says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. So this means that I owe it to you to love you. And you owe it to me to love me. This is what the scripture says. The only debt we should have is to love one another. We owe it to each other to love. And a lot of the problems that people experience in their lives from childhood up is because this love has not been directed to them or not been perfected to them. or it, They have been abused in one way or the other or taken advantage of. So I owe it to you to love you. You owe it to me to love me. And that's the only kind of debt that we should have. Amen? And verse 10 tells us, in essence, how love works. It said, it worketh no ill to his neighbor. So this is how the, the manifestation of love should operate in our lives. It should not, it works no ill to his neighbor, or love does no harm to his neighbor. It's not a feeling. <laughs> it's a doing thing. It's something that manifests through our lives and our actions and our behavior in our attitude one towards the other. So it's not about feeling. It does no harm to another. It works no ill to our neighbor. So in other words, what the word of God is saying is that any action or any word or any kind of behavior that harms or that hurts somebody else or by extension, the body of Christ is not, working, walk, is not walking in love and it's not pleasing to God. So therefore, we need to watch how we relate. We need to judge our own actions. And we need to make sure that our responses are in a godly way. We have to be concerned, brothers and sisters, about the kind of effect our words and our actions have on other people. Whether it's our husband, or our wife, or our children, or the neighbor next door, or our employees, just people in general that we come into contact with. Because we figure that the people close to us, we could behave how we want. You know? We're at home, they know us, and I could just say what I want and disrespect you and talk in a manner that is condescending. And we figure it's pleasing to God. And that's the problem with the church world today. We have one standard here. We have another standard at home. And we wonder why there isn't harmony. And there is so much breakdown and confusion in our relationships. But we need to be aware. We need to be concerned about the kind of effect our words and our actions have on other people. Even if it's the person closest to us. It could be a child, a teenager, a husband, a wife. God is concerned about how we speak. The person in church, the usher, the person directing cars. Amen? Employers to employees, all of these things matter. Remember, God wants us to go a little further. Okay? So... Love, in essence, is not, as we said, not about how we feel. It's not about what we want. And it's not about what pleases us. It's all about seeking another person's good. All right? And many times we do things and we say things that affect people in negative ways. And we, are, and we wonder why we are having so many problems in our relationships. And so this morning we want to look at some practical examples concerning right and wrong behavior. Um, I just jot down maybe three examples because we can't cover the entire spectrum of things concerning our behavior one to the other. Some things are basic. If we go through 1 Corinthians 13, we, we will see a basic outline of how we are supposed to respond one to the other. But these are some other avenues that God wants us to address in our lives. He wants to challenge us to go a little further in our love walk. And he wants us, first of all, to look and to be very careful about our words. Now, some of us throw words for other people. 
You know what I mean by throwing words? I don't know if it's a Trini thing, if it's a Caribbean thing, or if it's a people thing in general. But sometimes when we are offended and we don't have the courage to come and handle things the right way, we throw words. We just say something out of the blue. And we make comments and we blurt out something pretending it to be in a general sense. We pretend. I didn't, you know, I didn't mean nothing. But you know in your heart, and everybody else who heard the comment knows that you are sending a message for somebody or for people in general. How do we know? Because it's a spirit thing. It's a spirit thing that comes out of our spirit that either cuts and somehow or another, you know when somebody's sending a message for you. It's not hard to detect. And this kind of behavior, brethren, causes division and it causes strife. Now, people might not say anything. They just they listen to the comment. They know that it's, it's being sent for you, for, for them. And you just hold that in your heart. They keep that because... The whole thing is being handled in a wrong way. And it causes, the end result is that it causes division and it causes strife and it causes separation in relationships. Whether it's home relationships or whether it's church relationships or job relationships or whatever. It is not the way to handle matters. If something is wrong, the Bible instructs us how to deal with one another. How to deal with one another. This, only, this kind of attitude and approach only hurts unity. Unity in whatever arena we may be in. Unity on the job, unity in the church, unity in the home. It's harming and it's hurting and it's causing division and confusion. There's a way to deal with matters. If we have an issue... If we have a constructive comment, the Bible says go to the person or say something in a constructive way, in a humble manner, in private if it is necessary, not throw words for them in public. And there are many wives that turn off their husbands because of this bad habit. Something is being said, something is being preached, and we have to make a comment that is directed to our spouse. That only brings shame or embarrassment to that person in public. And we think it's over until we hit the car. Or until we reach home. And instead of acknowledging that what we did was wrong, we're denying it and say, no, 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 I didn't mean nothing. I just said that, that, that in a general sense. And, but we know in our hearts the things that we do that causes breakdown in our relationships one with the other. And so there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And if we want to build and to go a little further in our relationships um, with one another, in our love walk, we need to watch these bad habits that we may have um, inherited or cultivated over the years from mommy or daddy or whoever else. This kind of attitude and approach only causes embarrassment and irritation to the other person. And all we are doing is making a bad situation worse and we're causing breakdown in a relationship. You know, God's word is not sent to us for nothing. And we take lightly sometimes the, w the way that his word instructs us to deal with issues, to deal with each other. We take it lightly. I mean, we hear it, we hear it all the time. It comes up in messages. We read it in the Bible. There is no other way than talking something out in a constructive, humble, and proper way. Not everything is made for the public's air, especially family matters, especially issues between husbands and wives. So this issue of throwing words, we need to put lay all of those things aside. Hmm. And something is said and we react and we, our body language and everything. I mean, it just is horrible. It's a spirit that is released and it turns the other person off. We need to watch that this morning. 
God wants us to lay aside childish things. Lay aside childish things. That is childish behavior. Some of us, we're very open. Very open in our opinions. And we make comparisons between ourselves and others based on our own insecurities or pride. We voice our opinions and we make comparisons between ourselves and somebody else. And sometimes it is rooted either in insecurity or it's rooted in pride. Whatever the root is, both are wrong. The approach is wrong and it only breaks down relationships. It hinders our love walk, our relations, one with the other. We make comments and we say things that suggest that we are more deserving of a post or a position than somebody else. Or that we are being treated unfairly because we feel that somebody else has more favor with the boss or with the pastor or with somebody else. We throw these remarks out. And what it does is that it turns people off. The Bible says that we should esteem others better than ourselves. It's not a self thing. That's not the way that we promote or we get... Um, promoted in the kingdom of God. That is not the way that it is done. It is the law that advances us. It is the law that promotes us. It is the law that gives us favor. We can't blame somebody else who has the favor of God on their lives. It is God to bring us into that place or into that position. Amen? So to pass these remarks suggesting that somebody else is because they have favor with this one or favor with that one, or that I am more deserving, I could do a better job than so and so. I mean, it's all, it is all self. It is rooted in pride. It is rooted in insecurity. Both are wrong. It's going to hinder us spiritually. It's going to hinder our relationships with God. God wants us to lay aside all of those things. Amen? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so it is very, very easy to see what God is targeting in our lives if we truly listen to what comes out of our mouths. Remember, as we said before, spirituality is not based on performance. It's, a, it's based on godly character. It is based upon godly character. And God wants us to develop on the inside. Most times we're working on the externals to get better in this or to get better in that and to go through the motions of externals. Not knowing that the anointing of God increases upon our lives as we develop internally and spiritually. His backing and his favor is upon our lives, whether we are qualified or not in our own selves. Amen? Some of us are very competitive in nature. We might not want to admit it, but we are. And as a result, inwardly, we're always striving to outdo the other person inside. Whether, in whatever arena, church, on the job, on sports day, whatever. We are competitive in nature. And we're ready to kill and devour for whatever the reason. And we're always striving to outdo the other person. It's a kind of thing that's inherent in us if we have that problem like if ministry is all about competition you know some people strive even in ministry mid pulpit ministers there's an inward competition people in the pews people in functioning in different areas there is a competition sometimes that operate like if ministry is about who can outdo the other one and some of us as believers even on the workplace we are we're willing to to step and do all sorts of unscrupulous things to step on others and do all sorts of ungodly and unscrupulous things just in order to advance in the workplace. Born again believers. This is not walking in love, remember? It is not just towards brethren in church. It's our approach to everybody. We're supposed to reflect Christ to the world. 
We're supposed to reflect Christ to the world. And God is concerned about how we deal even with the unsaved because we are supposed to represent who he is. Who he is. Amen? What we need to be striving towards, brothers and sisters, is to be all that God has called us to be. This is what we need to be focused on. Striving to be all that God has called us to be, which is to be like him. We, don't, we, we focus on striving to be better in our gift or better in our talent or better in our abilities. And we fight and we devour one another when we need to strive to be godly, to be like Christ in every which way and not compete with one another to be better than them. It's a wrong attitude. That is not walking in love. The end result will only be strife and confusion. Amen? 1 Corinthians 13 tells us love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not behave in an improper way. That is what it means by unseemly. It does not behave in an improper or inappropriate way. It does not seek her own. It does not seek her own interests. It seeks the best for the other person. Amen? So God wants us to go a little further. Let's look at some things like resentment and bitterness. Now this is something that always comes up in messages because the Bible says that offenses will come. It's always something that we have to deal with and fight against. It's that always an issue that we will have to contend with throughout our Christian walk to make sure that our hearts remain clean. Amen? It's a challenge. And we're still talking here about our love walk. People who are presently struggling with resentment and bitterness oftentimes react or lash out in spiteful ways. In an, in an attempt to get back at the other person. To make them hurt. This is how we know sometimes that we have been affected or wounded. That is how we know that we have resentment in our hearts or bitterness. Bitterness oozes. And it normally manifests itself in spite. Or in malice. Or in some kind of retaliation. So if we say with our mouths, well, I don't really have resentment. But every time something happens, it, something is, the venom is coming out. And we are doing things and saying things that are spiteful to the other person. We know that there is something inside of us. Amen? But this, the way of, this, this way of reacting one to the other. Remember, God is calling us to go further, right? I mean, we could just hold it there and say, oh, we could work it out and work it out. But God wants to challenge us this morning concerning our relationships. This is, not a, this is not the kind of way that we're supposed to deal with inner hurts. They will come. People will say things, do things. And depending on the degree of the hurt or the offense, it might wound a little more. But this is not lashing out and throwing words and reacting that is not god's way of dealing with hurts do you know that there are some christians that even pray ungodly prayers towards other people i don't know if they pick it up in other religious back you know from other religious backgrounds but they pray they pray to god to do somebody something lord you see how so and so hurt me kill them lord let them feel the pain let them smite them with some kind of disease we, we say these things, Lord, torment him. You see how he tormented me? Deal with it. And you're asking the Lord to plead your cause. But what can, who, which God are we praying to? Which God are we praying to? I wonder who we are praying to. Spite and retaliation of this, you know, spite and, spite and retaliation and praying all these types of prayers is totally unscriptural. And it will not receive the backing and blessing of God when we operate in this manner. This is not walking in love. And let me just say up front that 
to every level that we attained, that we attain, we will be tested at that level. So the offense that comes at this level will be different to the offense that comes when we are babes. Because God will not give us more than we can bear. So we have to know how to handle it in the right way if we really want to grow and have God's backing in the situation. Okay? The Bible clearly tells us in Romans, firstly, that we should not be overcome by evil. But we should overcome evil with good. So that when evil comes to us, to offend us, to hurt us, when somebody does us something that seems evil, first of all, retaliating and spiting the person is like being overcome with evil. But we are supposed, we are supposed not to be overcome with evil. Okay? Now, I am, I, I am by no means downplaying or making light of hurt or pain. I'm not saying that it's a light thing and we could just throw it off. It's a very real thing at times, but we have to know how to deal with the matter because it can act as a stumbling block in our lives and it will hinder us. We have two options when we are offended or when we are hurt. Either to hold on and nurse the hurt feelings until it festers and becomes a wound, or we could fight and continue to fight against the ungodly feelings and reactions that sometimes want to consume us. We have two options when we are offended. When somebody does us wrong, we can either hold on to it, nurse it, bad talk the person, cause it to fester, eat up ourselves, or we could try to fight off and resist the temptation to harbor ill will in our hearts and to, and, and to react in a particular way. If we choose to hold on to the hurts, the result of that is only misery and torment all the days of our life until we're ready to surrender. We will never be happy if we're holding on to resentment and bitterness. We will only live tormented and we will be miserable and we will be unhappy and bound up and tied up in every which way. As opposed to handling God's way and allowing him to bring about healing and restoration to our lives. So we have two kinds, we have two options when we are faced with um, dealing with resentment and dealing with hurts. So you know sometimes when we are hurt, we tend to make everybody else around us miserable. Because we lash out, we end up, it, it, it ends up sometimes destroying our families. It affects, sometimes if there is a squabble or a disagreement or something between a husband and a wife, you know who gets the brunt of it? The children. Because they're in the, in the environment where they're getting the brunt of all the bitterness and all the spite between both parents. In a ministry, the same thing applies. It affects the entire body if there is an issue between people. So we need to know how to handle things to continue to, um, to keep the unity of the spirit in whichever environment that we are in and to handle things in God's way so as not to hurt the body of Christ, so as not to hurt the other person even though we want to hit out of them and in essence hurt our own selves in the process. Does that mean that fighting the feelings is going to be an easy thing? It's not going to be easy. That's why it's called a fight. Amen? But with God's help and with the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, we will be able to overcome those feelings. It might take us weeks. It might take us months. But if we really put into practice what the Word of God says, we would be able to overcome. It all depends on our response to the Word of God and our yieldedness to what the Scriptures say. Amen? Amen? I have found in my own life that prayer, which is simply talking to God, which is simply crying out to him, it activates his power in my life. So if something is wrong, if I'm disturbed about something, rather than let it ooze to people, we go to God, you cry out to him, and I find that sometimes, most times I should say, the power of God, the enabling power of God, is activated in my life to help me deal with the situation. Being in the presence of God continually 
and creating the right kind of environment, whether it's in our car, in our home, putting on music, listening to the right kind of messages, will all help us in the overcoming process. But I find that the key is being with God, being in his presence, listening to the right kind of, listening to music, getting my heart right, my spirit right, and also, thirdly, responding in the right way to our offenders. If we only seek in the Lord and praying, and Lord cleanse my heart, but when the test comes and we come face to face with the person, and we pass in that person straight, and we govern up ourselves and pretending we're not seeing them, we're just fooling ourselves. We're talking about moving into a different level. Amen? So it's, it's, it's incorporating both calling on the power of God within us to help us overcome these negative emotions and negative feelings and then doing the practical working out our salvation with one another in responding in the right way when we come face to face with our offenders. Amen? It's not going to the other person and bad talking them. It is looking to the person, smiling at them, saying them good morning. Remember, love does not do anything to harm or to hurt the other person. We're only going to be hurting ourselves if we pass them straight. We think that we're doing an injustice to them, but we're setting our own selves back. Amen? So God wants us to go a little further, and he wants us to grow in our love walk. And he wants us to put into practice the things that we have learned. Because if we do not apply these basic fundamental things in our relationships, we're going to remain at the same place for as many years until we decide to change. And we will be very unhappy. And what's the sense about living a long life here on earth and live unhappy? Our home life is unhappy. Our church life is unhappy. Because we can't, we have a problem getting along with people. God doesn't want us to focus on other people this morning. He doesn't want us to focus on whoever we think has the problem. He wants us, personally, to go a little further in our love walk. So we're here to examine ourselves. Amen? Matthew chapter 5 and 44 tells us, it's all familiar to us. It is Jesus himself saying, Remember we said that how the unsaved, the unredeemed cannot love in this way? Jesus said, love your enemies or the people that make you their enemies. Bless them that curse you. You want to turn to it? Matthew 5, 44. He says, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. It is not easy, but if we just do it, remember it's not a feeling thing. It is not based on feeling. It's, a, it's based on doing what is right in the sight of God. The feeling will come in after we apply the word. If we choose to walk in obedience, the feeling, you will feel the presence and backing of God upon our lives. The favor of God that he approves of our response. He says, love your enemies. Bless them that speak evil of you. That's what it means by curse. Bless them. In other words, you don't speak back evil words against them. Do good to them that don't like you. Pray for them that use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. You see God's love? There is no... Um, he's good to everybody. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. If we love them which love you, Jesus says, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans or the unsaved do the same thing? And if you salute your brethren only, what are you doing more than other people? Do not even the publicans so. And he goes on to say, be ye therefore perfect, 
perfect in love, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Amen. Let's look at another thing that's very prevalent in Christendom today. And that is the question of prejudice. <clears throat> I love this topic. What is prejudice? Well, according to Oxford's Dictionary, prejudice is a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience resulting in unjust behavior formed on such a bias. Sounds deep, eh? <laughs> I'll say it again. It's a preconceived opinion about somebody, okay? That is not based on reason. We just form these opinions based on how somebody looks or how we think them to be. And it results in unjust behavior that is formed on such a bias. That's what prejudice is. In other words, simply put, is when we prejudge people. And sad to say, there is a lot of bias and prejudice operating in the body of Christ today. There's a lot. It might be swept under the carpet or under the, in, under the surface, but it operates. I believe it's not just a present day thing, but it is something that has always operated throughout the church world. Because I believe it's not just, I don't believe that preachers are preaching enough about it. That's one. And two, I do not believe that we are as perfected in the love of God as we should be. Prejudice is one of Satan's most used weapons to divide the body of Christ. It is one of his most used weapons that divides the body of Christ. It even divides families. And somehow we feel that God is not concerned with our prejudices. But I have news for all of us this morning. He is concerned. He's concerned about how we think and how we feel and how we treat people. If God was prejudiced, like some of us are, where would we be today? I just throw that question out to you. If God was prejudiced, like how some of us are, where would some of us be today? If his favor was only on the Jewish people, you ever thought of that? If God's favor was only on the Jewish people, what place would Africa have? What place would China have? The Philippines have? Canada have? The Middle East have, what place would we all have in the kingdom of God? So God is not like man. God has made provision for all of mankind. He deals with all of mankind in the same way. That whosoever would call on the name of the Lord, whosoever, whether we're from Africa, China, India, the Philippines, whether we're poor, rich, tall, or fat, the Bible says, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and would embrace him as their savior, they would be saved regardless of what social standing or background they have come from. God's kingdom is open to everybody. Okay? It's open to anyone who would embrace Jesus Christ as their savior and repent of their sins, regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of their social standing, regardless of what they have done or what they have not done. Because in the kingdom of God, people's past, there are some people who, who grew up in a kind of morally upright family. They never did anything very wrong, but they were conceived in sin. So they need Jesus Christ as their savior. And they have in the kingdom of God people who are, who are murderers and who were prostitutes and who were part of the down and out of society and they embraced Jesus Christ as their savior and salvation came to them as well. Amen? So God's love is extended towards all men. He is not prejudiced. God is not like man. 
He does not think like us and he does not see as we see. And even though we are born of his spirit and we boast, we are the children of God. We are part of the elite of God. Yet at times we behave like if we are another man's child. Like if we, we are not a part of God who is like that. Like, it's like our behavior reflects like we were born of somebody else. That somebody else is our father, not God who is in heaven. God is love. And he has no part in prejudice. Prejudice is of the devil. It is of the devil. When a parent, brothers and sisters, would favor one child above another, all because of the color of their skin or the texture of their hair, tell me if that's a God thing. Do you know it's prevalent in the church world? Is the child responsible for how they came out? Is the union of the two parents, especially the two, pa the two parents are mixed. Some can come out very dark. Some can come out very fair. And you wonder if they're from the same parents. But they are. And there is favoritism, favoritism as a result. It's a horrible thing. There are some preachers in the kingdom of God that preach a black Jesus. Now tell me. A black Jesus. And, it's, and the thing was sweeping America. It came down to Trinidad. And as a result, it caused great division in the body of Christ. Is this a God thing? Whether Jesus, black, white, Asian, or whatever, he was a Jew. I'll just leave that up to you. He was a Jew, okay? <laughs> to my amazement, when, I went, when we all went to Israel, and this might seem very humorous, one of the sites we visited was the Basilica of the Annunciation, which was situated, situated in Nazareth. I don't know why they sent us there, but we went, okay? It is supposedly the traditional site, supposedly, eh, where the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would give birth to Jesus. It's supposed to be where, where Mary lived. So they built a big basilica there. And to my amusement, I mean, I stayed in the courtyard because I was kind of tired going into those churches. To my amusement, there were huge pictures of Mary situated throughout the courtyard because all of them couldn't fit in the church. And what was very amusing is that there was a picture of a black Mary, a white Mary, a Indian Mary, a Chinese Mary. All the nations of the world sent a picture there. And she was portrayed in their national, whatever, culture, whatever. All to appease the prejudices of man. We can laugh, but it's still happening in Christendom today. Still happening in the church world. There is prejudice in the pulpits. There is prejudice in the pews. There is prejudice in government institutions, and we know about that. There is prejudice at every level of society. What hurts me is when it operates in the body of Christ. God is not like man, and he expects us as his children to reflect his character and his nature to all men. If we misrepresent God, brothers and sisters, to people by our own prejudices, we will be accountable to God. It's a serious, serious thing. If we represent who he is, because his love will touch anyone and, any, and everyone who would embrace him. If we misrepresent him and his love for mankind by our own prejudices, we will be accountable to God. If we are not walking... If we are not working with the Lord in building his kingdom, then we are working with the devil to destroy it. If we are not working with the Lord to build his kingdom, then we are working with the devil to destroy it. It's as simple as that. There are no gray areas. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathers not with me scatters abroad. What is required of us is that we make a stand. This is where we need to make a stand. Not 
against color and race and creed and that kind of nonsense. What is required of us as children of God is to make a stand between what is right and what is wrong. What is right and what is wrong. Also, what is righteous and acceptable in the sight of God and what is not acceptable in the sight of God. These are the stands that we need to make. It must be based on righteousness and unrighteousness. It should be based on what is right and what is wrong. Not on who the person is and the color of their skin and all the things that we have inherited from our forefathers and families growing up. Amen? Our judgments should be based, should not be based on the color of a man's skin, his social standing, or none of the foolishness that we get involved in. And so in order for us to move on and to go a little further in our love walk, in our relationships one with the other, all of the things that we mentioned here this morning must be addressed in our lives. It must be addressed concerning how we relate, how we deal with issues, the things that are in our hearts, the things that we think and feel that nobody else sees, but God knows they are resident in there. We, as I said before, we can't have one standard for church and another standard at home. We can't behave like angels in church and on the job when we're relating to unsaved people, we behave like beasts. That's why some of them call us hypocrites and that's why they don't want to come to our church and listen to the preaching because they figure we are reflecting. If that's what we're reflecting, they don't want any part of it. The message this morning <clears throat> is not to condemn us. It's never to condemn. It's to challenge us to move forward. It's designed, first of all, so that we can see ourselves, our true spiritual condition, to see the areas that we are lacking. Everything might not fit into everybody's camp, but there are some things that fit. So we need to see where we are spiritually and we need to put things right in our dealings one with the other. Is it going to be easy? No. It's a challenge because dealing with people is never an easy task. More so, don't say amen too quick. <laughs> dealing with people is, a, is not an easy task, but dealing with ourselves is a greater task. It's a greater challenge, I find, to deal with our own selves, to manage our own feelings and emotions and thinking we we'll quick to point the finger at somebody, you know, people ain't easy. Try to control your thoughts. Bring it under subjection. Bring your actions into subjection. And that is where true strength is needed. Amen? Not in looking at other people. So in spite of all of these things, we need to understand that the task is not going to be easy. Dealing with ourselves is going to be challenging. Because in all of us, in all of us, you and me, there are traits of selfishness, there are traits of pride, there are traits of stubbornness. We all have issues. We might not have the same issues, but we have different kinds of issues. All of us have weaknesses, but we have strengths. All of us have strengths too, thank God. And all of us have flaws. All of us. Okay? But in spite of all of these things, God wants us to take our eyes off of whoever, anybody else, everybody else, whoever is coming to your mind right now. And he wants us to focus on ourselves. Amen? He wants us to focus on ourselves and he wants us to be all that he has called us to be. He wants all of us to go a little further, as our pastor said, and put things right. If we are holding on to hurts and offenses, we need to deal with those issues. If we are saying things that we should not be saying, zip it. If we are handling things the wrong way, we need to put things, do handle things the right way. If there is prejudice in our hearts, we need to understand the God's character and stop entertaining and causing those wrong feelings to fester. Jesus said to us in John's gospel, a new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. 
by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. Amen. Let's all stand.
precious Lord, our prayer today is that you will create in us clean hearts. That you will renew a right spirit within us. That you will continue, Lord, to dig deeper in our lives. For as we have just sung, there are higher heights and there are deeper seas. There is a level that you desire us to come up to, Lord. And that is to be like you. To be transformed into your image and into your likeness. And to be conformed into the full stature of Jesus Christ. We pray that you will continue to build upon the foundation that has been laid in our lives. That there will continue to be growth and development as knowledge and instruction comes to us we thank you for your mercy towards us Lord in spite of where we may be help us to be as merciful to others as you show to us help us to be as merciful Lord to others according to the mercy that you continuously show us help us to be transformed and be like you each and every day so precious God we yield ourselves to you once again we choose to embrace your word and appropriate it to our lives give us the strength to respond and not to react in the time of temptation in the times of trial and in the times of struggle bring your word back to us Lord bring your word back to us and continue to teach us the good and the right way. We commit all things into your hands. We commit this church into your hands. And we pray that your purpose, Lord, in raising up a people of holiness will continue to be at work in this ministry as you continue to send your word through various speakers here. That your purpose will be accomplished in the life of every believer. That we will truly represent you in every which way. So we commit our lives afresh into your hands. Help us to be doers today of your word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 You may be seated.